Hello and welcome to this EBID Green Cities event. <coughs> My name is Nigel Jollins and together with Lynn O'Grady, we co-lead the EBID Green Cities program. Over half the world's population live in cities. And cities are at the front line of dealing with the physical, economic and social fallout of a wide range of challenging crises, such as the pandemic, climate change and war. So what are the impacts on cities? And how are cities responding? And how can institutions like the EBRD help cities? These are the questions that we're going to address today. And to help us to do this, we wanted to bring real citizens, real residents from cities, in to participate in this conversation. So for the next hour, you will hear resilient voices of citizens from across our regions, the challenges that, that their cities face and how they are ad addressing them to build a resilient future. They will also be putting questions to our panels of mayors, the private sector and international financiers. And finally, we will also hear about the role our Green Cities program has in building this resilient future. Just some logistics, this event is also being translated in English, French and Turkish. So I'd now like to hand the floor to Matthew Jordan Tank, our Director for Sustainable Infrastructure Policy and Preparation um, at the EBRD here. He's going to give an overview of EBRD Green Cities, past, present and future. Matthew, over to you. Dear mayors, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for joining us here today at this first in a long time in-person EBRD Green Cities event. Um, cities are at the forefront of, uh, forefront, of course, of today's challenges. Uh, they account for 70% of energy use and three quarters of greenhouse gas emissions and therefore are absolutely key to tackling the climate emergency. And with the war in Ukraine, cities within Ukraine and, and in neighboring countries have demonstrated true leadership and big hearts, frankly, shielding and wel welcoming residents and internally displaced people and refugees while keeping essential infrastructure and services functioning all the while. We can only salute this remarkable resilience. Now over the next hour, we will hear some resilient voices from our green cities in Lviv, in Amman, Gaziantep, and Sarajevo, and what is really important to make their cities greener and more livable, but also on how their cities are dealing with uh, and have dealt with the situations of war. Crises do emerge. Internally displaced persons, for example, in Lviv, who are now facing this, this tragic and serious situation, hosting large number of refugees in Amman and in, in Gaziantep, has, as has been done over many years, and in fact rebuilding destroyed infrastructure, as was the case in Sarajevo many years ago. Um, we will discuss what our EBRD Green Cities program continue, can continue to offer to our citizens in meeting these challenges together with our municipal and private sector partners. Now EBRD Green Cities is indeed a flagship program for us through which we have financed 67 green and sustainable infrastructure projects totaling uh, 1.6 billion euros since 2016. These include clean and green trolley buses in Sarajevo, a solar plant outside of Gaziantep on distributed solar basis, um, electric buses in Amman, and improved water and wastewater services in Lviv. These green city projects all have deep, deep impact and in, aggr in aggregate amount to CO2 savings of 1.3 million tons, which is the equivalent of taking all the cars off of the streets here in Marrakesh and more. So moreover, when a city joins the program, it becomes part of a thriving and growing network now standing at 56 green cities, all of, all of whom have the, uh, the collective ambition of a green and sustainable future for their citizens. Seven of these cities are indeed in Ukraine, five in Bosnia and Herzegovina and four in Turkey. In Jordan, after Amman, we expect Aqaba to join, with electric buses and smart solutions being the main areas of focus. Here in Morocco, um, we are in discussions with a number of cities, uh, including Marrakesh and other regions, to join this great program. We really hope that we can get at least one city on board very soon. 
Now, critically, this program does not stand still and adapts to the needs of the hour. In response to COVID, the Green Cities Action Plan product, better known as our GCAPs, developed by our cities for our cities um, and supported with EBRD-funded consultants, was retooled to include a risk and vulnerability assessment together with more emphasis on gender and inclusion and digital solutions. In, this, in addition, we are now linking all GCAP investments to nationally determined contributions, the NDCs, <coughs> to support cities on their journey to meet the climate ambitions of the Paris Agreement. Now, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, cities are once again at the forefront, and further adaptations will be required to the GCAPs, which as soon as conditions allow, and let's hope that is very soon, we, could, we will provide a ready blueprint for rebuilding cities to the highest standards for a future that is green, digital, resilient, and offers equal opportunities to all, including all of the Ukrainians who will indeed return home. EBRD stands ready, as always, to support its, citizens, its cities at this critical time. These include ex exploiting the power of our growing network, connecting our cities with each other to share experience and know-how, involving cities in decision-making through deep stakeholder engagement and partnership with our donors as well to secure much-needed grants, concessional loans, and guarantees, all to address urgent, sustainable infrastructure needs to build back better. I'm really looking forward to this panel, as I know all of you are out there. Um, very much lo look forward to the discussion. And now I hand you back to Lynn and Nigel, who so both expertly lead uh, this flagship program for EBRD, so to get us all underway. So over to Lynn. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for that really good starting point for today, to today's discussions. I am delighted to be joined by five panelists who will provide their perspective on city resilience and, this emerge, and the emerging impact of the crisis in Ukraine. Fatma Shahin, the mayor of Gaziantep, Turkey, who is a true ambassador of a green and livable city. Edin Forto, the prime minister of Sarajevo and one of the pioneers of the Green Cities program. Sham Aldin Gafar, the managing director of the EV charging Divi division of Infinity Energy in Egypt. Sue Barrett, the infrastructure director for this region and Turkey from EBRD. <laughs> and finally, joining us virtually from Ukraine, Sergei Kiral, the deputy mayor of Lviv. Hello, Sergey. Thank you for joining us, Sergey. And the first question goes to you. So given, given the current situation in Lviv, your city has become a hub for humanitarian shelter and aid, aid while at the same time keeping econo economic activity going. Can you tell us all on a day-to-day -day basis how, li how Lviv is dealing with this? Uh, Sergey, can so you unmute yourself, please? Uh, you need to unmute yourself on the Zoom. We have, uh, we have unmuted ourselves. Yes. Can you hear us? Okay. Thank Over you. to you. Uh, thank you again for having me and uh, for inviting us to this uh, panel and for the uh, many years of uh, uh, strategic cooperation, uh, in fact, collaboration we had with the IBRD. Uh, life indeed changed uh, since 24th of February, the, when Russia attacked yet again Ukraine uh, in the war which started back in 2014. And uh, in addition to the Ukrainian armed forces, which you know the whole world is watching how brave and courageous they are in putting a lot of resistance to the Russian aggressor, the cities and the communities were also the ones which are taking the hit. The civilians and civilian infrastructure, unfortunately, is being targeted. 
and uh, some of the cities, in fact, are being uh, annihilated. Um, if you look at Mariupol, uh, Borodyanka near Kyiv, uh, a lot of smaller cities in uh, Kharkiv region, in Donetsk region. Uh, these are uh, the pictures which are seen right now, uh, which are, you can see in, in many parts in north and east and south of Ukraine uh, nowadays. Lviv, indeed, being uh, located in the western part of Ukraine, have become um, a kind of a safe haven uh, for many Ukrainians who are forcefully displaced. According to the UN, uh, right now, this is about 13 million uh, internally displaced people, about more than three or four million have become refugees. We have turned uh, a humanitarian hub. Uh, we are uh, hosting in the city more than 200,000 IDPs and more than half a million in the region. And this indeed is putting a lot of pressure on the city and the city's infrastructure. From day one of this war, we have continued to provide all the necessary services, including the water, heat, and uh, electricity. And this is also thanks to our cooperation and the investment we've been receiving from the EBRD, also as part of our GCAP uh, program, uh, but also some of the actions we took in order to improve the resilience of the city in cooperation with other partners here, I mean the United Kingdom uh, Embassy and the UK College, Emergency College, because thanks to them, we have put together a, a platform uh, together with other state-owned agencies and authorities, but also made sure that no matter what, no matter what the situation, that the city continues to function. And just to give you an example, we made sure that our water supply system continues to work in case of the electricity cut off. And that was one of the recent bombardments of the city of Lviv when three power stations were hit by the Russian cruise missiles launched from the Caspian Sea by the strategic bombers, by the Russian strategic bombers. Uh, two of our pumping stations uh, continue to function because we have purchased sufficient number of diesel generators to provide electricity. So resilience in addition should become an addition to the any meaning of the sustainability of the cities uh, and Ukraine and Ukrainian cities is a good uh, case for that. I look forward to our continued discussion and uh, further contributions. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, thank you, Sergey. I mean, and those those those visions those those visions that you you showed us on the screen were were pretty hard hitting. Yes, and we're we're, we're so honoured to have you here, Sir. Hey, thank you for joining us. I'd now like to introduce some other guests. We're honoured today to involve three people in this panel who are passionate about their cities and working directly on the ground to make their cities more sustainable. These are our citizen participants. Benjamin Krulienkovic, a student in Sarajevo, Seda Moftulu Gulec from Gaziantep, and Sami Hurani, leaders of tomorrow in Amman. We're going, to, um, we're going to come back to Sami later because I think he's joining us near the end of the event. So, um, but first, we're going to see a pre recorded video of Sami. Uh, let's begin with our first video then, Amman. Amman, Jordan is a modern city with a rich history. The first southern and eastern Mediterranean metropolis to join EBRD Green Cities. 76,000 citizens were engaged as part of its Green City Action Plan, using varied and innovative activities to understand what communities need to help build a resilient and sustainable city. مسؤولية مشتركة تتطلب ثقة أمانة عمان بالمواطنين وسكان عمان بقدرتهم على صناعة القرار والمشاركة وهي واحدة من الشغلات يمكن كان من الاقتراحات والتوصيات بالخطة عمل عمان مدينة خضراء أن يصير في تواصل مباشر بين صناع القرار بالأمانة ومجلس الأمانة 
برامج محاكاة أو برامج فيها نوع من تقمص الأدوار يكون موظفي أمانة أمان بقسم التواصل مع المواطنين العاديين يتبادلون الأدوار وكل واحد بيشوف عمان من من منطلقه للناس تجاوب بشكل عفوي ايش بيشوفوا مدينتهم ناقصها ايش بيشوفوا اقتراحات لهم انه يضيفوا لهي المدينه How can the international community contribute to more sustainable support to the cities? So Shams, can I put that question? Please, to really put it in the yes. context of what you're doing in Egypt with Infinity Energy. So over to you. Yes, um, let me start by thanking the EYD team for this uh, great meeting. Uh, I believe creating more awareness uh, among the cities about the importance of sustainability, uh, especially in developing countries, and learning from best practices uh, from countries that are uh, on target in achieving their uh, uh, uh, climate goals. Also, I think applying uh, more pressure on governments um, to promote sustainable solutions through uh, incentives for the private sector and also the end users, which would be the citizens uh, in that case. Uh, I think also um, uh, providing know-how for uh, uh, new cities that are being built to be built in a futuristic manner uh, in order uh, for them, if they are uh, uh, willing to, in to install any renewable uh, uh, a project like a PV project or EV charging stations, for example, it would be done without any uh, additional or unnecessary cost being bared. And finally, I think also local banks and global banks should focus more on providing attractive uh, uh, financial solutions for um, uh, small and medium-sized uh, projects in addition to the utility scale and the mega projects. Thank you. Thank you, Shams. Um, some really good points there. And I wonder now if I could hand over to Sue. Uh, in your experience, how can the international community contribute to more sustainable cities? Over to you. Um, thank you, Nigel. A very, a very good question. And uh, I think actually I'd like to pick up on what the citizens themselves said, which I think was absolutely spot on. Um, and that is what's, I think, important to ensure um, the, that, that we support the sustainability of the... Um, provide sustainable support to our cities, is to ensure that there's buy-in there's buy-in from that Green City Action Plan. In other words, acceptance of the actions uh, that are proposed and also a willingness to implement them. And this requires very strong stakeholder engagement with all of the stakeholders to ensure that the, um, uh, the actions that are developed are, are well received and, and really fit what the city needs. Um, just to give you a sort of a sense of what we do under the Green City Action um, Program when we're developing or helping our cities to develop GCAPs, I should stress that those GCAPs actually are for the city and they're developed by the city. So it's not us. It's very important that those Green City Action Plans are owned by the city and, uh, and its citizens and that that development process includes all the relevant stakeholders from all the disciplines, um, all the interested parties, and they are numerous. Uh, if you just think about who, who has an interest in those uh, Green City Action Plans, it's the city administrations themselves, it's the municipal uh, utility companies, it's the ministries, it's the public agencies, the private sector, civil society, uh, the, the uh, academic institutions, and really importantly, the citizens themselves. And it's the input from all of these stakeholders which are needed to ensure that the GCAP is integrated and effective in the way in which it's developed. Um, and how do we go about it? Well, at the very beginning of the process, uh, we, uh, or the city, we help them through the use of, of, uh, of, of consultants to develop a stakeholder engagement plan, which is developed with the city, identifying all of those key stakeholders that need to have a voice in its development. And it also sets out how to engage with all those stakeholders and crucially when. And I think another important point is that the stakeholder engagement plan is a live document, so it's updated through the process. It's disclosed, and everyone has a chance to have their say. And actually, those, uh, those experts that help the city to develop the, uh, the GCAP, they, they plan to have about four stakeholder workshops at various key stages throughout the development process to make sure that they are accurately reflecting the views of the city and its citizens on what their vision is for the environmental challenges and, the, and in particular, the priorities that are included in the, in the Green City Action Plan. Um, as we heard, uh, Amman actually, their stakeholder engagement was particularly impressive. 
And uh, I think the, the number of uh, 76,000 citizens were involved in, uh, in uh, stakeholders rather, not just citizens, in the GCAP process. And it was a very extensive program and it used technology effectively. Around 70,000 people were reached by an online awareness raising campaign on Facebook and it was called Aman in Green. And the way they were engaged was by providing case studies, sharing ideas, sharing success stories, asking those engaging questions and sharing articles on key topics so that the citizens of Amman had a real opportunity to express their concerns and offer suggestions and ideas about Amman's uh, green future. And this process also helped us to create a donor coordination group. And this is also really important because there are sometimes overlapping stakeholders with issues which affect the lives of citizens. And it really brought together that nexus between development and humanitarian issues. And as you mentioned earlier, the issue not just of making the city green, but also receiving and integrating refugees. And this was helped by this overall stakeholder engagement process. So I think the way that we can create sustainability is making sure sure we have a really strong Green City Action Plan which everyone buys into and can be implemented. Okay, thank you very much, Sue. I mean, what I, what I take away from there is that, that importance of city ownership, that importance of stakeholder engagement, and Sue also brought in this refugee angle as well, which we will talk more about. So we're now moving to Sarajevo and to Benjamin, who will present the younger generation's perspective on his green city. Thank you. Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina is looking towards a more resilient, sustainable and greener future as part of EBRD Green Cities. Sarajevo's Green City Action Plan has identified clean air as a priority. Together we are creating a more sustainable infrastructure for the city. Now, the younger generation is helping build a resilient city. Zajednica ima ograničene resurse koje moramo utilizirati na najbolji mogući način. Voda je resurs koji nam je ograničen, pa njena upotreba također je od velikog značaja. Zagrijavanje saobraćaja je veliki jedan problem, pogotovo u stare vode gdje imamo već dugo vremena probleme sa sa zagađenjem zraka. Pa u suštini veliki je broj mogućnosti, odnosno projekata koji se mogu realizirati na planu uh, održivosti, odnosno uključivanje građana u, u takve projekte od velikog značaja primarno jel, kako bi svaki od, od građana, od članova zajednice uh, projekte doživljavao kao svoje. I tek na takav način u stvari gradimo društvo koje osjeća odgovornost prema onome što, prema zajednicu u kojoj živi. What can Sarajevo do to create a greener and more livable future? <clears throat> Fantastic. Thank you, Benjamin, for that recording. Now, I wonder if I could ask Edin. I wonder if I could ask Edin. Uh, Prime Minister of Sarajevo, Benjamin, has put the question there. What are you doing to create a, a greener and more sustainable Sarajevo? Thank you. Uh, well, the, the, it's a quick key question. Before I answer, I would like to say that uh, my heart and hearts of uh, citizens of Sarajevo are with the Ukrainian citizens. Uh, the aggression that was totally unprovoked is something that is uh, hitting us hard as well because we have a massive PTSP that was triggered after the, the aggression started in February. Uh, just currently in Sarajevo, we have, we have a public debate of how many children were actually killed during the siege of Sarajevo. Was it uh, 1,600 or 1,500? And uh, so the scars will go for decades uh, unhealed. So uh, my heart is with, uh, with the Lviv, but also all other cities in Ukraine that are being, uh, that are being uh, attacked. Uh, how, how do we create a better future and greener future for citizens of Sarajevo? Well, uh, it seems like the light motive here is the, actually is talking with the citizens. After having uh, really damaged infrastructure during the war and not, not quite uh, excellent management of, of the resources of Sarajevo, uh, after the war, 
we had we had some really really funny things happening. For example, the capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina had uh, water rationing in 2017. It was massive. And uh, so if you ask citizens what the number one problem is, of course they'll tell you the water supply. So we, we responded quickly after taking power in uh, 2018, late 2018. Now we have an EBRD sponsored project, not sponsored finance project uh, for the water supply. Uh, also, when we, when we came on as a government, we, we had a polling of uh, asking people, this is 2019 in the summer, what is the number one problem? And the uh, vast number of people, the, the biggest chunk of the, of the answer was actually public transport, which was completely in shambles. And uh, we immediately budgeted for that. And uh, EBRD and partners are a big part of this. Um, most of the projects are now in the, tra in the traffic sector. Uh, extension of, of a public transport network, extension of especially electrically uh, powered uh, vehicles. So it's trolley buses that we have since the 83, year 83, tram tracks extension and reconstruction of current tram tracks. Uh, Sarajevo has had electric tram since 1895, and uh, it's something we, we also want to, want to cherish, want to refurbish, and want to extend the network. We are, all, we are also insisting on uh, renewing the fleet. Some of the trolleybuses are 40 years old, some of the trams are 50 years old, and uh, we are also having ongoing projects with uh, re, uh, renewing the fleet, especially trams and trolleybuses. Also, uh, since uh, Benjamin from Sarajevo said that uh, air, clean air is a big problem, uh, we have a really congested air, and uh, there are two sources. Uh, one is the, one big source is the heating in the winter where households and public buildings, uh, uh, they use uh, coal and wood, and it's a big problem for, for our air, but also traffic congestion. So in, in addition to really expanding our public transport system, we are also looking into traffic uh, adaptive uh, management of traffic, which is also an EBRD finance project. And uh, we are looking into extension of the district heating, uh, moving away from our total dependence on Russian gas, but this, was, this decision was made even before, before the current events, current uh, aggression on Ukraine. We actually want to diversify our, our uh, energy source for the district heating, so we're uh, looking into introducing heat pumps into our district heating system. Currently, it's mm -hmm. over 80% natural gas. So, so an ambitious program of investments. 188 million euros currently million. in, uh, in uh, ongoing projects. Yeah. Uh, out of which 161 is EBRD, we have some in the EIB, in the European Investment Bank, and we also, have some, of course, have some grant money uh, that, is, uh, that we're looking to increase. <laughs> so uh, our, uh, our how to keep this going is yeah. actually to keep citizens involved uh, and uh, how to, we have to sell to the public that this is exactly the type of in investment that we need after not having this uh, 20 years after right. the war. Energy efficiency, public building, extending biking infrastructure, uh, and, and more investment in public transport is something we're looking on. But we also so. want to uh, try to get private sector more involved. We are looking into uh, helping uh, gain land uh, right. for uh, uh, private sector for uh, wind and solar. So it did uh, maybe many, many more. So just to, add, to answer this question, there's, yeah. there's a lot of homework to do. In and I, I think a theme that's coming out here is this importance of public consultation, the, the participation of citizens. I wonder if we could come, just stay with you for a second. Um, you mentioned at the beginning your emotional connection to what's happening in Ukraine and Lviv. You're a city, you, you're the prime minister of a city that's been through conflict, recovered, what advice, now that you have, we have Sergei online, what advice would you give to Sergei based on your city's experience? Well, take care for, for one, and I hope, I hope that the defense of Ukraine will be successful. Uh, but after, after this, the reconstruction effort, we have uh, a lot of experience with that. Management of massive aid 
that is that is going to pour in after after the war is stopped hopefully sooner rather than later this uh, uh, we've had a lot of mismanagement in in uh, in uh, this di distributing aid so if if we have a framework green cities action plan is a framework for us it's it's easier for us to sell to the public to tell them look here's a group of projects there's 30 projects they are expensive but you can pick any political party and any government can pick from the list and we know that it's good we know we've calculated everything we know that it's going to be good for the citizens so having this framework and fill right. it in immediately after the war has stopped is is important and then of course uh, managing that uh, mm. because uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of uh, help that is going to pour into Ukraine, but yeah. uh, managing these resources can, Thank you. can have a big impact on what happens 10 or 50 or 20 years later. Thank, Thank you. Thank they you, can Edin. Learn from our mistakes, actually. Yeah. Thank you, Edin. I mean, maybe, maybe I can ask Sergey his thoughts on, on what Edin has said about um, a, a city recovering from conflict. Any thoughts on that, Sergey? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, first of all, for the, for the kind words and the, the words of support. Uh, uh, we feel it. We need it. Uh, and in fact, it's unprecedented, uh, the level of support uh, Ukraine is having from all over the world. Um, uh, from the pictures you saw uh, and what's going on on the ground, it's, it's obvious there will be uh, there must be uh, a quite a, a large-scale international uh, effort uh, to, to support Ukraine in the reconstruction. Uh, all the damage being done in some cities like Mariupol, uh, completely ruined. 95% of the city's infrastructure uh, uh, was, uh, was uh, destroyed. Uh, more than 30,000 uh, civilians killed. The, the city continues to, to put resistance, and, and nevertheless. Um, we, at the same time, um, are trying to do our best um, to uh, mobilize the liquidity in order to continue on some of the, including GCAP investments uh, that were started before the war. And that's something we are talking right now with the bank um, um, about the new maybe solidarity package, um, some deferrals uh, on the payments so that this work for in the cities, uh, like Lviv, the ones who were, which were less affected uh, uh, by the war, uh, can, can, go, uh, can go on. But uh, I agree completely that uh, uh, there must be um, also uh, proper mechanisms uh, put in place, um, and uh, the, uh, the amount of money, the amount of resources needed uh, for, for this effort is also unprecedented. According to the Ministry of Infrastructure, it's uh, 60 to 80 billion uh, US dollars. It's just the direct damage uh, uh, caused by the Russian invasion on the Ukrainian infrastructure. And most of that uh, is pertinent to the cities. Thank you. Thank you, um, Sergei. Thanks again and some, some profound insights there. Um, I wonder if we could come back now to Benjamin. Um, Benjamin's question, Mayor Shaheen. Thank you so much for joining us here on this panel. Could you tell us, please, uh, what is your city doing to create a greener and more sustainable future? Ben öncelikle değerli başkanları, hanımefendileri, beyefendileri e, sevgiyle, saygıyla, hürmetle selamlıyorum. Şahsım adına, ülkem adına bugün aranızda olmaktan OECD Şampiyon Şehirler İnisiyatifinde İBRD'nin Yeşil Şehir kategorisine girmiş olmaktan duyduğu mutluluğu ifade etmek istiyorum. İBRD'ye çok özel teşekkürüm var. Hem e, ortak e, dünyamız olan gezegenimizi korumak için büyük bir beşeri sermayesi var, insan gücü var. Daha da önemlisi şehirleri buna hazırlıyor. Yeşil şehir olmamız için e, bize yol gösteriyor. Sayın Başkan'a ve bütün ekibe çok teşekkür ediyorum. Ben parlamentoda görevimle birlikte Kurucaylı Bakanlığı yaptım ve 2014 yılında Gaziantep'e Büyükşehir Belediye Başkanı oldum. Aynı zamanda mühendisim. Mühendislikte bize ilk öğretilen şey ölçmediğiniz hiçbir şeyi düzeltemezsiniz. 2014 yılında 
İman Master Planı, Ulaşım Master Planı ile birlikte İklim Master Planı yaptık. 8 Bayağı yıldan geliş. beri şehri Doğru. yeşil şehir yapmak için e, büyük bir gayret gösteriyoruz. İmar Master Planı, Ulaşım Master Planı ve İklim Master Planı'nda uh, Mayor Şahin, I'm sorry. Okay. I think we have a problem with the interpretation. It's it's it's it's back on one. It's back on okay. one. Back on one. Yeah. English is back on one. It's okay. Okay. Please, Mayor, yes. continue. Tamam. Ben e, öncelikle İBAD'ye çok teşekkür ediyorum. Bugün İBAD'nin yeşil şehir inisiyatifinde olmak şehrim adına, ülkem adına e, bizi çok gururlandırıyor. İBAD'nin ortak e, dünyamız olan gezegenimizle ilgili çok büyük bir inisiyatifi var. E, yetişmiş insan gücü var, daha da önemlisi bilimsel altyapısı var ve güçlü finansal desteği var. E, bunun için çok özel teşekkür ediyorum. 2014 yılında Gaziantep Büyükşehir Belediye Başkanı oldum ama ondan önce parlamentoda görevim vardı. Kurucu Aile Bakanlığı yaptım. Aynı zamanda mühendisim. Mühendislikte bize ilk öğretilen şey ölçmediğiniz hiçbir şeyi düzeltemezsiniz. İmar Master Planı, Ulaşım Master Planı ile birlikte İklim Master Planı yaptım. İklim Master Planı da şehrin kirletici unsurlarını çıkardım. Şehir sanayi şehir, sanayi nasıl yeşil şehir yapacağız? Attığınız su nasıl balıkları öldürmeyecek, ağaçları kurutmayacak, insanları hasretmeyecek, bunu çalıştık. Ve nasıl akıllı sanayi olacağız? Beraberinde yerel yönetimlerin en büyük görevi ulaşım. Ulaşımda akıllı ulaşımın altyapısını nasıl oluşturacağız? Sera gazı salınımını azaltacak, nasıl tedbir alacağız? Burada özellikle filolarımızı gençleştirdik, CNG ile otobüslere geçtik, derhal elektrikli otobüslere geçmemiz gerekiyor. Şu andaki en büyük elimizdeki işimiz bu. Ve bizim açımızdan katılımcılık, gençlerle birlikte şehri yeşile hazırlamada bisiklet ve bisiklet yolu çok önemliydi. Bisiklet yollarımızı hızlı tamamladık, bisikleti teşvik ettik. Ulaşımda akıllı ulaşımın teknolojik altyapısını kurduk. Üçüncü en önemli başlığımızdan bir tanesi ısınmaydı. Kömürden doğalgaza geçtik. Ve yenilenebilir enerji, bugün EBRD ile yaptığımız 27 megawattlık yenilenebilir enerjide güneş enerjisi, biyogaz... Rüzgar enerjisi ile ilgili şehrin yenilebilir enerji haritasını çıkardık. Bugün İBRD ile çok güzel bir altyapı çalıştık. Şimdi şu anda Paris Anlaşması imzalanmasıyla hükümetimiz parlamentodan hemen anlaşma imzaladı. Çevre Bakanlığı'nın ismi değişti ve bütün şehirleri şu anda yeşil şehir yapmak için çalışma yapıyoruz. Bizim bir farkımız 500 bin mülteciğimiz var. Dibimizde koca bir kaos var. Bugün Kiev'in yaşadığını Bugün e, Polonya'nın yaşadığını biz yaşadık. E, 500 bin mülteciyle nasıl yaptık bunu? Bir e, paradigma dönüşümüyle, katılımcılıkla yaptık. Kimseyi geride bırakmadan herkesle birlikte yeşil dönüşüm yapmak için yaptık. O yüzden bu önemli bir çalışma. Şehri dirençli hale dönüştürmeniz lazım. Sağlıklı yapmanız lazım. Ve etki analizlerini yaparak yaptığınız iş ne kadar doğru? Vatandaşı da şehri de zihinsel dönüşüm olarak hazırlamanız lazım. Thank you. Yes, Mayor. I mean that is such a lesson, such a lesson for other cities. I think the way that you have managed the refugee crisis. Thank you for that, and also the leadership you're showing on the green space. Lynn, over to you, because I think we've got uh, we've got Benjamin here in the room. So, oh, so, so let's go, let's go to Benjamin in, Sar in Sarajevo. Benjamin, what's your vision for, uh, of the future for your city? Uh, thank you. I hope you can hear me. <coughs> okay. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the citizens of Sarajevo, I would like to uh, greet all the panelists and other present there in Marrakesh. Uh, I am sure that Sarajevo has found its place among the EBR, EBRD's uh, green cities for a reason. Namely, throughout the history of the city, it has been characterized by residential architecture uh, adapted to human size and needs. Uh, very rich in green, uh, green areas and uh, diverse floristic elements. Uh, over the time, the way of life, of course, changed, uh, but men's longing uh, or need for greenery remained. Uh, unfortunately, not so long ago, Sarajevo also suffered a war, as my prime minister already mentioned. Uh, after the devastation caused by war, uh, infrastructure had to be repaired first in order to return life to normal. And it seems that the city has now entered an era uh, of improving the quality of life. 
uh, some examples of building uh, cities resilience and providing uh, are, of, of, of course, uh, uh, providing public transportation services with low carbon emissions, uh, improving energy efficiency in housing, uh, as well as an integrated approach uh, for planning uh, with an emphasis on sustainable development and the circular economy. A uh, special role in all of this will, of course, be played by young people. So I believe uh, that the focus of future product, uh, projects uh, should uh, be facilities and sites that bring together especially young and educated citizens. Uh, well, personally, I know uh, there are challenges ahead, but I see numerous uh, positive initiatives and changes. Among other things, uh, throughout several projects uh, that are being implemented thanks, thanks to the EPRD. So the future of Sarajevo will uh, certainly be even more green and more resilient. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benjamin. And um, now what I'd like to do is introduce the next citizen pre-recorded video uh, from Ms. Seda in the beautiful city of Gaziantep. Gaziantep, Turkey is a historical trade and cultural centre. Home to over 2.1 million citizens, Gaziantep has provided homes and economic livelihoods for almost 500,000 refugees. As part of EBRD Green Cities, Gaziantep will use its Green City Action Plan to increase the sustainability and resilience of the city. Yeşil şehir demek, o şehrin toprağının kırmızı, gökyüzünün mavi, sularının berrak, ağaçlarının yeşil olması demektir. Bu da soluduğumuz havanın temiz, tükettiğimiz gıdaların da güvenli olduğu demektir. Gaziantep böyle bir şehir olacak. Kim böyle bir şehirde yaşamak, torunlarını, çocuklarını bu şehirde büyütmek istemez ki? Peki ya siz şehirlerinizi daha yaşanabilir hale getirmek için neler yapıyorsunuz? Thank you, thank you, Seda. So, Mayor Shahin, that's <gülüyor> that's your city. Can I ask you to respond to Seda's question, please? What are you doing to help? Şimdi en önemli kısım Seda Hanım'ın söylediği siz ne yapıyorsunuz? Burada özellikle katılımcılık ve şehrin yeşil olması, ağaçlandırmasıyla ilgili kısımda şehri bunu hazırlamak çok önemli. Ben aynı zamanda Türkiye Belediyeler Birliği Başkanıyım. Belediyelerimizi buna hazırlamamız gerekiyor. Gaziantep yeşil şehir oldu ama 81 şehri buna hazırlamak gerekiyor. Belediyeler Birliği olarak fikir projesi açıyoruz. Ee, özellikle e, sıfır atıkla ilgili, çevreyle ilgili, e, su yönetimiyle ilgili şu anda su yönetimi çok mühim. E, e, su yönetiminin e, beraberinde çevresel, küresel ısınmayı azaltacak e, çeşitliliği ile ilgili projeler yapıyoruz. Fikir projelerini hayata geçirenlere e, belediyeler birliği olarak mali destek veriyoruz. Ve daha da önemlisi şehirleri, Özellikle e, çocuk bazlı, e, eğitim bazlı çalışmalarda şehirleri bunu hazırlamak için belediye başkanlarımız e, her biri kendi içerisinde uygulamalar yapıyor. Hükümetimiz e, 5,5 milyar fidan dikti. Biz Gaziantep Büyükşehir olarak 100 milyon fidan diktik. Daha da önemlisi tarım okulunu açtık. Kadın kooperatiflerini, kadınlarımızı bunu hazırlamamız gerekiyor. Kadın kooperatiflerini kurduk. Hem kadınlarımızın bu alandaki aile ekonomisi şehri yeşile dönüştürürken yeşil güç oluşturma, yeşil ekonomi oluşturma bizim açımızdan çok önemliydi. Ve dezavantajlı bütün grupları, kadın, çocuk, engelli herkesi yeşil kalkınmanın parçası yapmak çok önemliydi. Bu yaptığımız çalışmayı da örnek pilot çalışma olarak 81 ildeki bütün uygulamaları koyduk. Sayın Cumhurbaşkanımızın başkanlığında fikir projelerinin iyi hazırlayanlara yarışmaların sonucunda ödüller verdik. Ve şehrimizin 2030-2050 yılında dünyanın yeşil olması, ülkenin yeşil olması ve şehrin yeşil olması insanımızın yeşil dönüşümü hazırlamak için de hep birlikte gayret gösteriyoruz. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Shaheen. Thank you very much for, again, like I said, the leadership you're showing in this space. I wonder if I could um, ask Edin a slight twist on this question. Um, what can you do, you know, in a, as, as a mayor of a city that's been involved in a lot of investments in the green space, what can you do to help other cities follow your example? Well, uh, Sarajevo is a leader in several categories in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, for example, how we tackle air pollution is something that can be also given to, to many other cities in Bosnia. Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina is reliant on, on coal, uh, our thermal electric plants, uh, and some heavy industry that is really, really taking a, lo a lot of lives, actually, but this, this is something that's not talked about. Uh, we can lead, definitely, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. But uh, by the, by the, uh, our approach to the GCAP, to the Green Cities Action Plan, and how we actually started so many projects, and uh, up to 188 million within the first couple of years of the adopting the document, I think that we can also be an example for the region as well. We are willing to share the know-how, and we are willing actually to, to work with other cities to create maybe even some project that uh, we can apply together on. Thank you. Thank you. So let's, let's move to um, Sue again. Can you, just, can you just detail what EBRD is doing to support cities? Yes, th thanks, Lynn. I mean, let me start by saying that um, I recently visited Gaziantep um, for the launch of Gaziantep's Green City Action Plan development process, which was hosted by, by Mayor Fatma Shaheen. And I would have to agree with, uh, with, with everyone that G Gaziantep is indeed, it's a beautiful city. It, it really is. Um, and it was actually, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Mayor Fatma Shahin, it, it was actually the first city in Turkey, I believe, to develop a climate action uh, plan, a climate action uh, a change plan. And we as EBRD were very proud to help you, I think, with the update of that plan in 2016. So it, it has been a living plan. It's been a plan that has been developing over the years. And we very much valued the 10 years that we've been working with your city to help you uh, transform it into a greener, a greener and, and pleasanter place for citizens to live. Um, as you know, we've worked hard with you on uh, greening the, uh, the, the urban transport system. And we were really delighted to partner with you again at the end of last year on a green solar project to help mm. you green your, your electricity energy supply. And of course, that was, the, that was the project which brought you into the Green Cities program towards the end of last year. And we were very, very pleased that, that you joined us to sort of continue your green, smart and, and uh, sustainable journey. Um, and I would say, just as you were saying, the need to sort of bring other cities in. Uh, Gaziantep was, was the fourth city in Turkey to join the program. So uh, Izmir, Istanbul and Ankara are also in the program. And uh, that this is, uh, these four cities are, are among over 50 cities now across 24 countries. So what we have in EBRD is a really powerful network, a, a really powerful green city network, which allows cities to come together and really learn from each other, share experiences, share ideas. And I think that's a way that we help to make sure that other cities are following on from the success of, uh, of, of Gaziantep. Um, I mean, we do it, of course, the, the support that we provide to all of those cities under that Green City program is really to bring together the strategic thinking, the strategic planning, and the investments and the policy measures to turn that, uh, that into reality. And I think Thank Matthew you, yes. mentioned this morning that about uh, 1.6 million euros has been invested in Brilliant. green infrastructure so far, which I think has been amazing. And we've seen a lot other cities which have gone even further in their green city journey. And this is really helping others to learn and become as, as good a place as Gaziantep to, to work and live. Thank you, Sue. And that's a great segue. Um, we have said uh, live with us here from Gaziantep. Um, I know you are an architect uh, working in the passive house space. Could you tell us a little bit about what you're doing personally to make your city more sustainable, Seda? Thank you very much. Distinction Sparks Punt. Uh, greeting to all of you from Gaziantep. I am Seda Müftüoğlu Güreç. Uh, as a master architect, I have been working for Gaziantep Metropolitan Municipality since 2011. With regards to green city concept, which is my area of expertise, 
uh, I have uh, contributed uh, to my stay in various ways uh, since the time I start my municipality career. Uh, some of these uh, achievements are as so. The first climate uh, action plan in Turkey has been prepared by the Gaziantep Metropolitan Municipality. Uh, an ecological step project has been prepared within an area 3 million uh, square meters. The buildings within this, this project consume less energy and water than Turkish standards and use sustainable energy systems. Uh, these buildings are environmentally friendly. In order to pose an, an example for ecological contractions as a building uh, which is 320 uh, square meters have been contracted. The structure has uh, received both lead, platine, and uh, dowart uh, with uh, the uh, Pacifau certificate, which is the first instance in Turkey. Gaziantep Ecological Building is the most environmentally friendly contraction in Turkey. Uh, we provide all energy needs of our uh, institutional buildings completely from renewable energy source. Uh, okay, uh, and the, uh, we uh, supplement our bus stops and train station where we can raise public uh, con conditions regarding renewable energy source and attract citizens with charging stations from handicap uh, vehicles and phones. Uh, within the body of the, uh, our institutions, we have realized so many works and continu continue to do so in the future. We shall make Gaziantep one of the best example of green cities of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Seda. Thanks very much. Um, okay, I know we now have Sammy joining us from Amman. Sammy, thanks very much for being here with us. We've seen your video, um, and I wonder if you could wonder if you could pick one thing that you um, really worked in stakeholder engagement that you think really worked in the stakeholder engagement in Amman, because this theme um, has come out, I think, across the panel that stakeholder engagement is, is critical to achieving sustainability. Sami, over to you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yes, indeed, I mean, stakeholder engagement, I think it's one of the most important components. I think what really, uh, if I wanna pick one, I would say the direct and transparent interaction with people. I mean, just when the municipality involves people genuinely and directly and equally, this is what really, made a big difference. For example, um, we usually hold something called Diwaniya debates, where we facilitate a direct interaction be between decision makers and just ordinary citizens in public arenas, in, in public parks, in at the side of the streets. I mean, such activities where you have direct and genuine involvement between the residents of a city and decision makers, where, you know, whether, uh, the various socioeconomic backgrounds of the people doesn't matter if they will participate or not. This is where it's, it's core. And one of the things, so, I mean, this contributed to the, to the revival of the public spaces, creating more social, political, uh, interactive dimension to it, and more trust from the citizens in their leadership in the decision-making process. Another thing was the simulation programs that, you know, the, the, the municipality uh, employees, they took the roles of the citizens and, and vice versa. So when, when, when that simulation uh, happened, both parties, they could uh, know exactly what challenges the others are facing. So as an ordinary citizen, I could see that being at the municipality level, it's not always as, as easy as we thought. It's not as fast as uh, we think. So in general, I think the genuine involvement, whether mainly uh, offline or online, um, having the decision, uh, participating in the decision-making process, the implementation phases, knowing about the expected outcomes creates the sense of loyalty, the sense of belonging, the trust, the trust of people in their leadership and in the municipality. And I, I really think that those three, loyalty, sense of belonging, and trust are essential for, this, uh, for, and for the success and the development of the city. Maybe I could just uh, reflect back to you that loyalty, sense of belonging and trust, such important uh, observations. Thank you very much, 
Can Sammy. I take? Can I now take um, this discussion back to Sergey for the, really the last remarks? And I just want to ask you, what is the one thing that the international community can do to support Lviv at this time? It's hard to single out just one thing, but uh, if you just really, really focus on the city, uh, the main objective I guess for all of us today in Ukraine is, is to survive and to defeat the Russian aggressor. And everyone has to play its own role and, and cities uh, are very important uh, stakeholders and uh, uh, a big part of, of uh, our joint and common victory. Uh, for us to sustain, uh, I guess, what we need uh, and to continue the GCAP investments to a certain extent, uh, I guess we need the immediate uh, actions uh, uh, done by the donors by mobilizing necessary support uh, not only for Lviv but for many cities in order to improve uh, the liquidity of the cities uh, you know we, we cannot even use currently the funds that we have in our bank accounts as the city because of the war and the, the restrictions uh, imposed by the government um, the other thing is that uh, many businesses are relocating from uh, eastern parts, the war zones of Ukraine, of Ukraine to the western part, including Lviv. And uh, uh, the city has put together a, quite a robust and comprehensive business support program. And this is where we also need support uh, uh, in terms of some donor funding to help us to co-finance uh, this program. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Sergei. And uh, unfortunately, this brings us now to the end of our panel session. So I'd like to just wrap up with some observations um, from the discussion that I've heard from our panel, from our citizens. I think I can summarize them in three S's. The first one is stakeholder participation. That's come through very strongly. Um, Sammy made the point in his recorded observation and, and fleshed it out with his loyalty, belonging and trust comment. I think the other one it, that we've talked about is the sustainability innovation, taking challenges that the city is facing and innovating to, to, um, to resolve those, whether it's in Shams' business, the private sector, whether it's in Mayor Shaheen and her work on the green space or Edin Forto, Prime Minister of Sarajevo, your investments in the critical infrastructure. Uh, and the third S, I think, has to be sharing of knowledge and experience. And we saw an exchange between Edin and... Um, Sergei just now about experience of dealing with a, a crisis in their communities through conflict. So with that I'd like to thank our distinguished panel for joining us today, our passionate citizens who are online now, Sami, Benjamin and Seda, thank you very much. Um, to Sergei in particular, thank you for joining us at such a challenging time in your city. Um, and I'd like to bring this to a close and invite you all to a drinks reception which is going to be held outside of this room. And for those of you who are interested, there's a water panel in the Auditorium des Ambassadeurs at 12 o'clock today. So if you please join with me thanking the panel and in particular a big applause for Sergei in Ukraine. <laughs>